and welcome to episode 15 of our second series powered by Netball UK. Now I'm joined as always by Mags and Sarah. Uh, Sarah's mixed up her background a bit today. So she has. Um, location if, well, if, she's if, keeping it fresh. Say, yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, it <laughs> looks like Sarah is in the laundry room or something. Where are you coming from, Sarah? Um, I'm actually in my flat in Nottingham. Just oh, you've gone home. Background. Yeah. I like it, I like it. Well, that's my that's my onesie hung up. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you slipping straight into that when this is done? Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and Mags, of course, as we record this, it is Tuesday, and we know obviously uh, it's Bake Off Tuesday. So, uh, what's on the cards for today? Today we have slutty. <laughs> God, this is going to sound really bad, isn't it? What slutty <laughs> brownies? What are what? those? Not my name, not my term. This is what it said in the book. Slutty brownies. Do you want me <laughs> to tell you? Yeah. Yes. But, but it would be Nigel is just the worst, isn't she? <laughs> but we love her. We love her. It's um cookie dough base, then with Oreos on top of it, oh. and then a brownie mixture on top of that. Okay, I mean. And in. apparently I'm that's in. the term. I can get on board with a slutty brownie. I can get on board. What about you, Sarah? Well, if that, if Mags is baking them, I'm eating. Yeah. Good and we have girls. got we have got so much to look forward to as soon as you know as soon as we're allowed back in the studio together, Mags, expectations are high. I trust me. Promise you. Motivation for, for exercising now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> whenever, whenever we next get back in. Oh. And in other good news, shops are open, and soon we may be able to go to the hairdressers. Long overdue. Ooh. And football is back, so 2020 Ooh. really is starting to turn around for oh, some Sarah's of us. Oh, Sarah's excited! Sarah's yes, excited. Yes, she is. And as ever, we've got plenty to get through in this week's show. So let's get cracking. The ANZ League in New Zealand returns this week, and matches are going to be shown on Sky. So we'll be talking about that and how teams will have prepared following a long postponement. England striker Marcus Rashford has called for the government to provide meals for poorer children during the summer holiday and it's got us thinking about all the amazing things sports people including netballers have been doing during lockdown so how important is it to be a good role model but before all that we'll be speaking to this week's special guest Surrey Storm player coach Mickey Austin hi Mickey hey Mickey hi thank hi, you very much how are you all we're yeah. good how are you yeah not too bad not too bad um, I mean, I think the obvious question, the one we've asked a, a guest every week in lockdown, how's lockdown been for you? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I can't really complain. I think a bit like everyone, really. It's been a bit boring and a bit tedious at times, but um, in comparison to sort of what's going on in the wider world or what some people have had to deal with, like, I'll take boring. Um, <laughs> and I think at this point in time, like, if you've got nothing to report, then no news is good news. So um, it's been okay, it just as everyone just trying to find ways to keep yourself ticking along, really. How have you been doing that? What have you been doing to keep yourself occupied? Oh God, a lot of training and just getting out of the house, um, mm -hmm. to be honest, you know, I'm, I'm in, a, in a flat with my partner and he's working from home. So um, it's just been about, you know, if I can and, and the weather allows, like just sort of get out of the way to allow us both a little bit of individual space to sort of do whatever it is we've got to do for that day. Um, and I guess training's probably the only real thing that in this time period, for sure, I've had like actual control over. Um, so I've sort of just taken that and run with that really, you know, just try to keep in it in as much of a schedule as I can, um, trying to just stay as motivated as I can for not really any overall gain, which has been quite hard. <laughs> Yeah, we've, we've spoken about that, the fact that, you know, it's weird not actually having something to focus on. So staying focused without having a target, it's, the, the, it's something that we never imagined we'd be doing. Yeah, and I think certainly like as an athlete, like there's a difference between training because you want to do something and training to the level of like what we're used to or the sessions that, you know, our normal week would have included. Um, and it's really hard to get up for those kind of sessions now when there's not an end goal it's like because before you would have been like right I've got this running session to do today I know it's going to hurt and make me feel like my lungs are bleeding but I have to do it because it's just necessary because of this end goal of getting back to netball or playing in this game or whatever it is whereas now it's like it's really hard to get up for that session get motivated for that session when you're looking ahead to a date in February of 2021 um so you just sort of just have to listen to your body and, and how you feel in that day you know and just be a little bit flexible in terms of do you know what like I don't feel that motivated to do this running session today so I'm going to switch it with this session instead 
Um, so not necessarily like just strike it off the list, but maybe just move your days around a little bit so that, you know, some days you wake up and you feel a little bit better or some days you wake up and it's like, no, do you know what? Like today is just a long walk and a stretch kind of day. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, you mentioned there about it can, it can be demotivating if you don't have a target. Um, when it was announced, you know, that Super League was going to be cancelled for 2020, you said, you know, I'm 100% behind the decision to cancel. Is that still the case now, even after seeing other sports coming back? Yeah, I think for me, it is just because I don't think you can measure our sport and its current sort of place in, in the sporting world versus other sports that are returning back on face value. I get it. And, it, you know, when you're just looking at, well, this sport's going back, so why can't netball? I understand. Um, but it's just not the same product. It, they're not set up the same. You know, we, we don't own our own venues. So like as it stands, we can't even get into our training venue. So even if we, we wanted to go back to some form of normality in our sense of the world, we just couldn't. Mm. Um, and for me, there was just far too many like question marks, what ifs that couldn't be answered at the current point in time because of the ever-changing COVID-19 situation. And I think at some point there just had to, a decision had to be made on it. And, and you know, I've said this before, but, um, and I think we was all in agreement to this, you know, you can't argue with people's safety. You can't argue with people's health. And, um, over, over overall that has to be the deciding factor and, and it was at the end of the day but really exciting that other sports are coming back you know for us uh, sports fans you know who sort of just watch whatever it is and don't just follow netball it's amazing to have actually something else on the telly as opposed to just mm. trying to flick through netflix I think we're going to appreciate it more than ever, actually, when we can watch it, aren't we? But I mean, it must be disappointing for you, albeit I know you agree with the decision, but not to be able to sort of show what you're capable of after Surrey Storm had like a pretty indifferent start to the season. There must be an element of frustration there for you. Yeah, of course. It's, it's really tough. You know, we've done a six month pre-season leading into what we thought was our 2020 season. There was a lot of hard work and energy and effort that went into that, but ultimately now regardless of the reason why will will we'll go to waste um but the, like the only saving grace is everybody's in the same boat like mm. what whatever reasoning or situation it is you know every franchise netballer athlete um that that currently feels the same way that we do um is because we're all in the same boat so like, no one's coming out of this benefiting from it um and and no one you know, didn't do all of that hard work and, and not have the potential to show it. Um, I think that the, the really tough thing will be um, an, an almost changing of the guard if there was players that were in that sort of like, oh, do I retire? Do I not? Um, question mark. Because I don't think we'll get a lot of changes going forward in terms of personnel like we perhaps are used to seeing in terms of like the main reason for players switching franchises before was probably um, either lack of court time or just not, not overall happy with the environment. Um, and after only three rounds or three and a bit rounds, neither of those two things you really get to experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you'll see a change of personnel more to do with lifestyle factors, you know, to be out of netball for this long, is, is real unknown territory for a lot of us and people's priorities change you know people's focus shifts onto careers onto the next stage of their life in in terms of motherhood or family um and and that sort of has to put netball to the back burner so it'll be interesting to see sort of in the nine months of off season we're now going to have like what's what sort of different life situations players are going to be in yeah, that is true. That is going to be interesting to see, right? Because we haven't discussed it from that point of view. But you're right, if you're at that kind of crossroads, um, we are going to find that out in the very near future. Um, you said, obviously, moving forward, Mickey, that you want to focus on making the league the most amazing product in 2021. How, how do you see that happening? How does it look to you? Yeah, I think first and foremost, there has to be sort of a, a, uh, a lack of discrepancy across the league. Like, I think netball fans as a whole are amazing um, in terms of their individual franchises but that now has to almost just be a generalized sporting approach as opposed to oh we're only doing this for this specific franchise or because I'm a fan of them or you know it, it has to be sort of a, a a football rugby mentality of home and away um, so that each and every franchise venue is stuck across the board 
um, get bums on seats first and foremost to make sure that, you know, if and when you are that Sky game, there is a, a sold out crowd there, audience uh, to show for. It. And then we've been talking about having, having more broadcasters on board and, you know, um, there's already talks in terms of behind the scenes of what we can do to make netball uh, visually a better product, which would look better on camera. So then we can start to have the conversation around streaming potentially um, to reach a wider audience or have more games visible as opposed to just the once every single week. Uh, but I think that bums on seats factor across the board is really, really important because I know there are individual franchises that are amazing at that. We're very lucky with our fan base at Surrey Storm. You know, they're absolute diehard in which we sell out our home venue three months before the season even starts. But Do you agree with that, Mags and Sarah? I mean, it would be great, wouldn't it, if you had fans? And, and I think you do have some diehard fans who do go home and away for all the franchises already. I know, let's be right back. I mean, you've got um, George Fisher's parents, you know, being a uh, point in question. You can always spot her parents, whether she's home or away. Um, and yeah, it would be great. But we don't have the facilities, as in the venues, that would be big enough probably to hold all of the spectators. So then do you look at the, do the franchises look at themselves and say, well, we need to, we want to be bigger. Let's get the venue that will hold them all. What do you make of that, Sarah? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit like chicken and egg with that, isn't it? Because I think sometimes it's like, let's, let's have a big venue and then we can, we can attract fans. And, you know, Thunder kind of did that. I think um, last season when they went to Bellevue, it was, it was a bit of an echo chamber. You know, it was pretty empty. This season we played them round three that place was packed. So actually, you know, if, if franchises can afford to take that risk and, you know, maybe take a hit for a couple, a couple, of, a couple of rounds of, of playing at home or even, you know, half a season where you're not getting sellouts, that, but actually having that increased capacity has, has really paid off for most franchises. So it would be nice to see more away fans travelling. We're not so bad because for Loughborough, we're quite central, so nowhere's that far. But, you know, mm. if you're a Sirens fan, it's a, it's a big commitment. <laughs> <laughs> some dedication um mickey um how how financially impacted a storm going to be by the decision to call off a season we don't actually know at this current moment in time the, the overall financial implication of what covid19 will have um and that's a real issue for just planning and going forward you know we're as a league, we're, we're trying to have conversations around, you know, when the new signing period should start and when those sorts of player conversations can be had. And it's like, well, I don't even know what our budget will be. Like, I don't know the, the impact of what last year will be. I don't know um, whether we're talking about a mass financial implication or, or whether we're talking about a little bit. I mean, obviously, I don't think we'll be as worst hit as some. Um, the reality of the situation is we're a franchise that's part of a university structure. So... Um, we're a little bit more protected in that sense. Um, but then that means we have to operate on university timelines, which at the minute are all very, very much up in the air and, and nothing's happening quickly. So um, it will probably be sort of August time before we really know the financial implications of last year. Um, but I mean, what I will say is, as I've said before, like no one's coming out of this situation uh, positively in that respect you know no one in this current climate has uh, made a profit or uh, will benefit off the 2020 season because because ultimately you know 90 percent of what we do is based on ticket income which has now had to go back so yeah. um i think it, it, it will just be about how innovative you can be if and when the doors do open um to some form of normality and what that will look like you know we can't even guarantee that if we can host something in well, this side of Christmas, that there'll be fans involved. You know, at this point, we don't even know that. Um, so I think we're just going to have to be really innovative and adaptable with, uh, you know, what we do for this next calendar year. And when I say we, I mean all of us. Um, and, you know, I think there's a point to be made around uh, financially the impact of what this will have on our communities as well. You know, I, I don't think going forward we can be able to just say oh yeah it's fine this is what our season ticket was before uh this is the price it's going to be this year or this is what the price of the match day tickets or etc etc you know we have to factor in the fact that 
our fan base uh, and and communities may be financially implicated from this as well and you know in order to get back to the point of where we was in terms of bums on seats and selling out venues we, we're gonna have to uh, take that into account as well so um, at some point when we do get back to some form of normality I don't think it's going to be a case of just start where we left off because um, I think that's gonna that's gonna be very very difficult to do you're right. There is so it's a minefield, isn't it? There's going to be so many things that need to be worked through um, to even see how how the land lies with it. Uh, I know you've got to go shortly, Mickey. But just before we let you go, being sort of a player coach, having that dual role, you, there must be some sort of responsibility on you to be reassuring um, the team to, to for them coming to you and saying what's going on. How's that been? What what have you? What kind of reassurance have you offered them? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's probably the hardest part of this time period, because all anyone wants is a little bit of certainty. Um, you know, people don't like the unknown, because it's just so hard to predict. And I get that um, players, certainly at this current point in time, where their future is potentially at risk, or we're talking about contracts up for grabs, or especially if you've got imports in your team, where, you know, that's their absolute livelihood. And bigger than that, th their visa expires. So what you know, what happens then? They're at a risk of, of deportation for, for want of not being over dramatic. Um, but for me and the way that sort of I operate, um, the girls always know they'll get two things from me, which is hard work and honesty. I'll always be upfront with them, um, whether that's for, for positive or negative. So at least they know where they stand and it's up to them with what they do with that information. Um, and that hasn't really changed in this time period. You know, we, we may um, not be physically getting together and, and seeing each other as much as we would like or we used to. But, um, you know, there's player check-ins that happen every single week. We have Zoom calls every single week just to catch up and chat. Um, we have coach uh, catch-ups every week, leadership catch-ups every week. So, um, and I think for 10 weeks, this only stopped two weeks ago, I was playing Quizmaster every single Friday night <laughs> to, to, to the girls and, and hosting a team quiz. So, um, it's actually been really nice to get to know them in that sense away from the netball court and just bond um, together because I mean you don't you can't do anything else but um, yeah I've, I've been as honest and as upfront as I can with them so that they know sort of the discussions that are going on um, they know things that are certain because I can tell them that the things that are uncertain unfortunately you know, it's just been a case of we don't know that at this current moment in time. And I get that that might be uh, really hard to listen to or not what you want to hear. But, you know, one thing I don't want to do as a, as a director of netball or, or as their head coach is to make any kind of promises that I can't keep. Um, so I would rather just have them wait and, and you know, be really honest about not knowing things as opposed to guessing um, and then potentially having that come back to bite us a little bit later on. So um, as, as soon as we have any kind of certainty on anything going forward, the players will be the first people to know about it. Yeah. Um, Mickey, well, they probably appreciate your honesty because, um, like you say, it is the only approach, particularly in these unprecedented times. And we appreciate you coming on and staying one minute later than you were due to. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Mickey. Thank you for joining us here on Netball Nation. And best of luck with everything before normality resumes. And uh, fingers crossed, and best of luck for everything when it eventually does resume. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Stay safe. Okay, Stay safe. Care. Thank you, thank Mickey. You. Take care. Bye bye. 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 Now, Manchester United and English striker Marcus Rashford has helped to raise millions for poor and vulnerable children during lockdown. This week, he wrote a powerful letter to all MPs asking them to back his initiative to introduce free meal tokens for kids and families who may otherwise go without food over the summer months. In it, he said, political affiliations aside, can we not all agree that no child should be going hungry? So, Sarah, over to you first. What, what do you make of Rashford's stance, which he's got a lot of praise, and, and rightfully so, in my opinion. Um, even from rival teams, actually. But what do you make of him doing that? Amazing. I mean, I'm obviously a Liverpool fan, so <laughs> there's nothing I like <laughs> enjoying more than hating that. <laughs> but it's just incredible. And I think I think what's so impressive as well is he's, what, 21? Like, 22, he's, yeah. He's that young. He's yeah. got the confidence to, to kind of come out and and not be not be boxed in as an athlete or a footballer but you know have a view on things that are important to him things that he has experience of knows about and he will like he will change things because his profile is so big even if the government don't make a u-turn on it you can be sure the investment in that as well as the 20 million he's already raised will will go through the roof and i think it's such a 
I, I heard um, I read it described as a power move today, and I, it is a power move. Mm. It's just like I'm here. I've got this opinion. I know I'm right. Like you're gonna hear it, and I love it. Yeah, you're absolutely right because I don't think anybody could disagree with what he's saying, and it is so important, isn't it? Um, you know, for people who are in the public eye and who are role models to take this kind of stance and be seen as not just a sports person, but as making real change. Um, you know, he plays for a high profile sports team and he clearly takes his responsibility seriously. Max, how, how did you handle that role when you were a player and of course now as a coach? You know, th times have changed and the, the spotlight was never as bright on us as, as athletes back in the day as it is now you know so the the term you know role model is real for so many players you know like there's play people spot sarah walking down the road and will know exactly who she is and want to run up to her and take you know uh, a selfie or can i have your autograph because i'm with stacy they're like oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, current current <laughs> So, you know, so like Sarah's era, as opposed to mine, you know, it, it sort of like hit the bright lights. Um, but I suppose what we need to remember is, is that we're not just uh, role models, you know, you're influencers as well. And, and for me, little things like making sure that you make time for these people who, who do actually put you on a pedestal. They don't know you as an individual, they just know you as a sports person. Um, and make time for them. And when you think you haven't got time to have that little selfie because you know you've got to be somewhere in five minutes, what will stick in their mind is that you did not give them 10 seconds of your time to take a selfie. Um, and the power now of social media is, is huge and they can sort of like, couldn't destroy me back in my day, what with a <laughs> <laughs> but, but with a with, you know social media goes a long way and you know like the likes of Rashford doing what he's doing um I think it's phenomenal exceptionally powerful I can absolutely relate to a lot of what he mm. said there and again he's in a privileged position as we are as coaches as we are as players to make a difference make time for people and be humble and honest and, and I think like such an important point to, for him to be a role model that's not talk, like it's not all about I'm sure he's got lots of cars but it's not all about fast cars and you know the bright lights and stuff like that it's it's still about you know the things that matter to him like the environment he grew up in wanting people to have um, a better childhood than than a lot of people can afford currently that actually it's role modeling you know being a good person not just being a footballer so you get all the money Mm. no you're right know, sorry sorry Miss Emma no, I'm thinking that you know the fact that he that I think what makes his story so powerful and the fabulous work that he's doing is the fact that he shared some of his own personal story with people so the the image to quite a lot of people is that he's just this talented young man who just happened to get signed up by a football club and the world's his oyster and yeah part of that is absolutely absolutely true um but it's the humble beginnings and the sacrifices that his parents made for him and you know the sacrifices for his siblings as well uh, and and the big leap of faith that they had you know because i think they picked the footballers up really really young and he's managed to come through and he's using the privilege of his sport but the experience of his background and, and, and he's going to be a dog with a bone he's not going to let go is he well exactly and doing more than I mean, it's, it's lovely, like, when, when sports people, you know, they get the pay packet, they buy the mum and dad a house and things like yeah. that. But he's more yeah. than that, he's, he's yeah. saying, you know, I want to help the community at, yeah. at, at large, not just my family and, you know, the people that helped me, but everyone deserves more than they're getting currently. Exactly. He wants societal change, and that is it's something that nobody can disagree with. Can you um, both think of any examples recently where netballers have taken a stance that's uh, paved the way for some sort of change or got people really talking about societal issues? Um, do you know, so I'm going to talk about one of the, the ex Loughborough girls. I mean, peace, peace Pascrovia sticks in my mind as um, both a role model and an influencer with a, within her own. Um, country of Uganda because I think she suffered some serious adversity as do you know members of her family and just lots and lots of people in Uganda and I think she was made like an ambassador for International Netball Federation and she's been away to lots of different countries talking about her struggles and how she's managed to to rise above it and how she gives back and I think if anybody gets the opportunity to spend time with peace you will just fall in love with her. Uh, because she's so passionate about her causes and you end up being passionate about them as well. And then you look at that, I mean, 
she sort of paved the way and now you've got Mary mm. uh, here from, from Uganda because people now believe that that's a possibility because peace did it. And I guess before peace, you had Maui Kumwenda who came from Malawi, mm. who showed African players generally that, you know, there's a pathway that they can make it. Um, and it is massive. And I think netball is actually full of great role models. Mm. You know, I think people underestimate the athletes that, that netball has. Um, like we've talked a lot about Layla and I was texting her the other day joking that, you know, all the Aussie commentators are going to bang on about is how she came and cured COVID for us. <laughs> <laughs> but she, like, she's a doctor. She, she then takes time out of being a doctor to go to a Black Lives Matter protest. You know, like there's, there's people in netball who are educated, who have strong opinions. I think a lot of the girls have come out in support of Black Lives Matter and done it in a, a very eloquent, thought out way like Halima Adio, Vicky Oyasola, um, lots of people in lots of teams um, have come out and supported it but in in a very educated way and I think that is is the joy of netball that you know we've got such great role models in it that kids can can look to those people and, and not just be like I want to be a netballer but oh look Ebony, Ebony Osoro Brown is a netballer and a lawyer I want to do that I, like, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a teacher. I, I want to have a career. I want to get an education. And so I think, I think netball is a sport, even though, you know, we, we moan about the lack of money that it's got. It's created extremely resilient, extremely well-rounded people from that. And Max, with that in mind, do you think um, in any sport, but particularly in netball, because obviously that's what we talk about, that there is a sense of duty that if you are going to play netball at an elite level, you accept that you are a role model and you do all you can to, to be a very good one. Yeah, I think if you are going to put yourself out into you know, the public eye and you are going to be that person that people turn up and pay to watch, you know, week in, week out. Um, th there comes a certain amount of responsibility with that particular role. And I know that within netball franchises, they will have sessions on how to conduct yourself and what's acceptable and what isn't. You don't, you choose to be a sports person. And with that comes that responsibility that you may well have to, you know, attend things that you maybe wouldn't feel normally comfortable attending, but you go because it's the right thing to do and you will interact and um, end up changing the lives of, of lots and lots of individuals. There's lots of people who will watch Sarah. There's lots of people who watch Stacey. And they I want to do that. I want to play. Um, and on the back of just seeing those girls play, they do now. And, and Max, don't take any credit away from yourself as well, because I think we've heard even throughout lockdown um, with COVID-19 and with the Black Lives Matter movement from both of you, um, how good role models you both are. You know, you've both spoken so honestly and openly about your lives. And we've had people get in touch with Netball Nation to say how much you've helped them during this time. So we see it firsthand here. So thank you. Because I know people will be listening going, well, they're my role models. I love them too. They help me. So thank you on behalf of Netball Nation listeners as well. <laughs> if you want to sit around I know, I know. <laughs> well, you see, the thing about this, Emma, is I don't see myself as that. I really don't. For as much, and this is the point that we're making, that, you know, for as much as I do not put myself in that position and say that, I know that there will have been things that I've said, things that I've done, places that I've gone, school events that I've attended, you know, um, and it will have had a positive impact on the attendees. And that's great because that's what it's all about, giving back. But I never intended it to be that. So if that's the case, then that's great. Well, I, th I think there's also been a bit of a, a shift, like, with the emergence of social media. I mean, you, you like, you watch The Last Dance and Michael Jordan mm. didn't want to be a role model. Like, he didn't want the media attention and things like that. And I think athletes now are kind of turning it on its head and being like, I'm not going to let the media dictate the story that's told about me because I can tell it myself through social media. You know, I can let people know who I am and what I believe in and, and, and my views on things without having to do it through kind of traditional press. And I think that's made a big difference to, to the way that athletes are, are perceived and the way that they use their profile for, for things like this. You're right. And I think it also means that they can help more people and be a direct role model for more people because they're able to do that. And I think it'd be a nice thing, actually, if you're listening to this now and thinking, um, when we're talking about this, you might have one person that you think, do you know what, they were my role model feel free to get in touch with us at Netball Nation and let us know. Uh, and then if it's Mags or Sarah, we can embarrass them next week and tell them that, yeah? Well, that, that'll probably just be me and Mags writing in. I'll write to you, Sarah. It's, it's a <laughs> 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 
<laughs> um, right, well, netball's back in our lives this week, and at the time of this show being released, it's one more sleep, guys. One more sleep. Sarah's got a onesie ready. She's going to jump straight into bed to make, make the time go faster. Uh, now, yeah. Elite Netball returns in New Zealand with the second round of the ANZ League, a whole 12 weeks after the first round in March. So, Sarah, we've been talking about it for weeks, but now it's here. How do you think the players are going to be feeling ahead of the first game back? Well, it's like the beginning of season again, isn't it? I imagine there's going to be like a lot of nerves, but a lot of excitement because that start of the season is a time when anything is possible. Like you can, you can win it. You can go on and score the winning goal in the final. You know, it's just the time when you're kind of free to dream. So I imagine that they're going to be excited. Lockdown will have have kind of heightened that even more. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be. It'll be tense times this first round, I think. A lot of nerves, a lot of excitement, a lot of rustiness. I think you're right. I think nervous excitement is probably what we can expect. Um, Max, how will the coaches have adapted training um, and whilst trying to keep it as normal as possible during this time? Right. Um, well, I think they got something like four weeks notice that they were going to uh, be running back into netball, which was just amazing. And uh, it's not like pre-season because it isn't pre-season, is it, for them? Because they know that in four weeks' time, they've got competition. So it's how do you get your girls who have been doing all this stuff in isolation uh, back and match ready? Coaches will have got the plans and they'll have uh, a schedule that works on, you know, the of raising incrementally the um intensity and the duration of the sessions because you can't just throw them straight back in to like a 90 minute session running them you know to the into the ground and then think everything's going to be okay so small increments um intensity and duration and then they will get them to a point where they will be you know doing stuff in, in isolation but all together then maybe you know small groups sideline drills all together and then bang let's get it hitting that full intensity and um the contact yeah build up to it and then hit build the ground up. running um now a standout fixture is reigning champions pulse facing last year's runners up on sunday so both of you guys who are going to be the players to watch in that game do we think well pulse's defense end is is intimidating to say the least they've got kelly jury and um, katrina dory and Karen Berger um, so I think that defence end will, will be very interesting to watch against um, Stars attack end because Mai Wilson was just a standout um, mm. in terms of the quad, quad series Nations, yes, yeah, Cup, quad, yeah. Nations Cup in January she played so well for New Zealand yeah so I think I think that matchup will be will be great to watch and then you know the, the whole game stacked really because then at the other end you've got Amelia Anacanasio who again was just Phenomenal for, for New Zealand in the World Cup. So, and how I strong is Aaliyah really... Dunn as well, Sarah? Aaliyah yeah. Dunn in there, so young. She's just unbelievable. Yeah, so I think, yeah, it'll be a good game for sure. Yeah, quite, definitely quite a few ones to watch in there. And we know that Sky are going to be playing the games with a select few available on YouTube as well. Um, both of you guys, how important is it, do you think, for the fans in the UK and other countries being able to watch some netball, albeit at weird times of the day? Well, I'll just be recording it and be watching it at the normal time of day for me here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, But, you know, we've mentioned many, many times on this podcast that, you know, it's not having sport has not been the end of the world considering what's been going on. But for those of us who love sport, it's, it, it, it's such an exciting time. And I personally love the ANZ League. For me, I bet it's my favourite. Um, so I'm excited. I've got my set ready, you know, series link for all these games. and. Um, I think that there will be a lot of response. People will be downloading it. People, I think you can get some of the games on YouTube as well. Uh, there's, there's a buzz around it. I've spoken to people and there's a massive buzz around it. So, yeah, long overdue. And, and we know that all games are scheduled to be played at the same venue in Auckland. Um, Sarah, what do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of that? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's funny because I think New Zealand did that when when they were still in, in some sort of lockdown and now they've completely come out of lockdown so they don't need to all be in one venue. Yeah. <laughs> so the advantages are, if you're an Auckland team, happy days. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I imagine the other teams will be keen to get that changed as soon as possible yeah. so you go back to home and away and they can get a few more home fans. Um, so yeah, we'll see what, what they do with that. I imagine they would be keen for that. And there's talk as well that fans might be permitted at some of the games at some point. Do you think that's the right decision, Max? 
Well, yeah, did I not hear something yesterday about the fact that tickets had gone on sale for wow. uh, the game? So I think the opening weekend, the Friday and the Saturday, is just for family, friends, um, you know, selected guests, I think, from, um, you know, the Australian New Zealand League. And then the Sunday and the Monday, uh, open doors, tickets can be sold to everybody. So there's going to be some atmosphere in that place. That's, that's for sure. And that's you know, Go I was on. Gonna say, you know what New Zealand netball fans are like as well. Like they're, they're so fanatical that net, like going without netball for a few months, that place will sell out. It's. Uh, I think. I think that's. It adds to the excitement of it doesn't it mm. knowing that there are going to be people there watching it and we're certainly going to look forward to that now guys we are going to have a virtual kitty reopened again nobody gets rich from this <laughs> well the thing is no not not even me because nobody has actually ever got put in a kitty if memory serves ah. me right so um we are go i'm going to hold you to this one right so um let's do score predictions for this week's ANZ oh. games first up Max Magic the Mystics. Hmm. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna give it to Magic. And the only reason I say that is because of the very, very young, inexperienced attacking setup, as in you know shooters for uh, Mystics. That said, I am so looking forward to seeing how the Mystic shooters do because I think the three shooters are all under twenty. And wow. that's just an amazing opportunity for those girls in, in you know, the top league in New Zealand. Mm. So on that alone, I'm going to give it to Magic. What about you, Sarah? Mate, I am going Mystics. I am so excited. <laughs> so excited <laughs> Mystics. Yeah. And this, like, Mystics are kind of like perennial underachievers. Mm. Like, they've always had really great teams and not done, like, not done as well as you'd think. But I'm so excited about this Mystics team. Like you say, like, Grace and Wecky and Savi Tui and people like that in the shooting circle. Really young, really exciting. Going to be fed by Petter Toyaba, who just bombs balls in. <laughs> all sorts. And they've just got the kind of player that make you want to watch the game. Like, I'm, I'm not a Mystics fan, but I'm going to watch that game because I want to see those mm. players play. And... Mm. Um, obviously, Phoenix Karaka is a friend, but I think she's been playing really well as well defensively. So I think the Mystics might take them, yeah. Oh, well, I'm happy because either way, money's going in that kitty. <laughs> so thank you, both girls. Right, moving on. Steel V Tactics, Max. Ooh. Oh, God. I've gone for Steel. Oh, full stop. I, I know. Go on. I've gone for Steel. I'm, I'm so excited about watching Kate Heffernan play. Um, I think she's an absolute treasure and one for the future i mean the under you know the youth within net, in new zealand netball at the moment who wouldn't want to be like you know the youth coach over there it's just amazing but i'm also looking forward to seeing her maybe match up against uh, crampton so that's going to be something and now she can take crampton and she can deal with crampton then there you go she's just quality in the package so yes yeah, deal deal for you mags what about you sarah i'm going tactics <gasps> Ooh. Ooh. Uh, T Temelisi for back. Oh, I Everyone know. I know. And Harry Watson. <laughs> She's a little bit crazy. Her and Jane Watson, mate, you would not get me in a circle against them two if you paid me good money. <laughs> uh, and then at the other end, they've strengthened because they've got Tapia Selby Rickett. So Tapia Selby Rickett and Ellie Bird, you've got a shooting circle. I've averaged about six foot four. So I think, I think they're going to have too much for steel. Oh, wow. Once again, guys, either way, I'm getting money in that kitty. Finally, Stars v Pulse. Max? I think I've got to have to, even though it's, you know, the, the winners of last season against the runners-up, I think I'm going to have to go with Pulse, but say, get that ball to Maya Wilson. If they can say, if the attack can service Maya Wilson and give her the ball, it's like good night just about every time she gets the ball. Um, I love watching her play. But on this occasion, I think I'm going to have to give it to Pulse and uh, not Stars. But it'll be close. Mags is going Pulse. Sarah? I'm obviously going Pulse. You know, that's my team. <laughs> um, but I, I do think it will be a good game. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if Pulse can kind of pick up where they left off. Um, last season, obviously, just, just one game this season. Um, but I think, like Mags was saying, all through this league, just so much exciting young talent and... Um, you can see from the teams that, that have been put out the great job that the Beko League has done for, for mm -hmm. New Zealand Netball like that, that, that league that sits under the ANZ is just producing player after player after player and all six teams you've probably got 
fifty percent of players coming through through the ranks for them. So they must be New Zealand must be excited about what what they've got coming through as youngsters. And do you know what's on the and the other interesting point or exciting fact is that they're playing them you know they are actually selecting these girls in their tent they're not just ha- all right there's a situation at mystics where you know bailey mez is injured and necessitates you know another youngster being pushed up but so you know that at least two of those youngsters are going to be on that court regular starting seven but the franchises are actually playing the kids as well, and well the when, when they separated from australia and everyone was like oh my god like it's the it's the death of new zealand netball they're never going to recover like privately i don't think like New Zealand were that worried because now they get to play these youngsters in an environment where it's not we have to win every quarter of every game all the time it's it's just a little bit more low-key you know that they get to play they get to play against world-class players still because all the new 90 percent 99 percent of New Zealand players are still there yeah they get to develop a, a a great rate but without that like crushing pressure of mm. you have to win and I think that's that's been the difference. And like the Beko League's done a great job. I think that the teams in the A and Z League have done a great job of bringing that talent through. And now you look at the Silver Ferns, and we were all kind of writing them off after Com Games in 2018. And you look at them, and you're going, "God, they're good for the next 10, 15 yeah, years." At least coming through. Mm. Well, it is, and we're all very excited to watch it. Like I say, one more sleep, and I'm sure that you, Netball Nations, listening to this are as excited as we are. Uh, we are going to wrap it up there. That's the end of podcast number 15. But before we go, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you the one question you never have an answer to. Any shout-outs, guys? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Tumbleweed. <laughs> Any shout-outs? No. No. Should we do, it. let's do a shout out to the A and Z League. A shout out to everyone that's going to be playing, yeah. yeah? Good luck to everyone, coaches, teams, players, fans, enjoy it. Yeah. You're going to have the best ratings ever online. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. Sky's, Sky's uh, subscriptions are going to go through the roof. On the, How can on you get ratings more than your country's population? <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> You're right. I think there's going to be a whole host of new netball fans as well after this week's up. Well, that is it for another show. As always, if there's anything you want us to cover in future episodes, get in touch at My Netball Nation. And remember, you can let us know if Mags and Sarah are your role models. We can embarrass them with that next week. Thank you so much for listening to Netball Nation, powered by the brilliant people at Netball UK. Have a belt and week and we'll see you next time. Bye girls. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. This is Netball Nation.